Hello everybody, this is Brian with the Instructional Technology Coordinator team here in the School District of Waukesha. In this presentation, we're going to look at strategies for managing a technology-infused classroom. These are classroom management strategies that will help you as iPads and Chromebooks come into your classroom to avoid distractions, to take control, and to make sure that the focus stays on teaching and learning and not on the use of technology. So let's get started. One of the first things you'll note about any classroom management strategy, whether it includes a focus on technology or not, is that it really is a good classroom management strategy no matter what's happening in that classroom. So just because technology is involved doesn't mean our classroom management strategies have to change all that much. In this case, we're going to start by focusing on just some really basic classroom rules. So when we create classroom rules and we embrace those classroom rules in our, cl in our classrooms with our students, one of the biggest, most important things to remember is that we should keep the rules simple. If we can choose just a few rules that really cast a wide net over all student behaviors, then we don't have to get into the game of playing cat and mouse where we say, don't do this, and they do some sort of kind of off version of that. And then, then you get in the game of students saying, well, that wasn't against the rules. So what we really want to do is create a group of rules, a small group of rules that focus on learning. Specifically in the case of a technology-infused classroom, these rules don't need to be adopted specific to the technology that the students have. In fact, we'd recommend that you don't do that. What we really should do is just identify what the acceptable behaviors are, and then everything else is out of bounds of those acceptable behaviors. So let's take a look at some sample basic rules, right? So on the left-hand side, you see four rules. Respect yourself, respect others, focus on learning, and be prepared. Those four rules worked before technology was available in classrooms and, and they work and they work with I can pretty much at any point point to those four rules and identify behavior that maybe isn't fitting in with those rules. So on the right hand side you see kind of a color coded. So what if a student's wasting time or they're not putting enough effort in or they've damaged your, your, their own devices? In that case, they're really not respecting themselves. Um, what if it's stolen, they steal somebody's, or they bully somebody else? They're not respecting others. So you can see there's a correlation between a behavior and the rule that fits it. But you'll notice again on the left-hand side, none of those rules identify anything specific with technology, although they cover technology infractions. And these rules also really focus on what students are supposed to be doing and not on a laundry list of things they should not be doing. So that's our coverage on rules, something to just consider. Next, we go on to the next piece, which is the idea of really keeping our students focused at the beginning of class. Starting class is such a critical time for classroom management. If you look at any of the, the really notable classroom management guides, strategies, books, experts, they all talk about getting off to a great start in your classroom. And so we're going to really focus on how we could maybe utilize the technology to get started right away in class and not leave any time for students to get off task. So one of the first things that we recommend is to use your digital presence. Now, what does that really mean? It means that where your resources are, obviously in our district we focus on Blackboard, but where your resources are, that should be the place that students are instructed to go as soon as they walk through the door. Well, why not just write it on the board or why not just meet them at the door? While those are the best intention plans, the reality is sometimes things come up, right? Sometimes a teacher gets stuck in the hallway helping another student or another teacher gets called in to do something. Sometimes a teacher maybe is sitting and working with a student who's having a hard time or needs some extra attention and they just can't make it to the door. They just don't get up there to write the instructions on the board. That's perfectly acceptable. That happens. That's the reality of teaching. But we have to have a place where we can consistently pre-plan and say, your day's activities, your starting activities, your bell ringers, they're here. And that's one of the great things about a tool like Blackboard. You can put it there in advance and your students know to look for it there daily. So we can do this the night before, the morning of, and then it's there and ready to be done. It also really communicates what can be done with you 
what needs to be done. It gives them some detailed instructions. You can include things like your voice or an intro video to get them started. And it's really not locking you up because they can do this right on their, their device. Meaning that if you're taking attendance or you're doing something else within, uh, within your computer, they have a screen in which they can really maximize their instructional time. Now, this is one of my favorite images uh, from my time in, in Waukesha. This is a, an image from a kindergarten first grade classroom. It was a mixed group. This is truly a Waukesha student. He is a kindergartner. And at the time that this was taken, he came walking through the door because it was time for math. He walked over to the cart because at that time we had a cart-based model. He walked over the cart and grabbed his laptop and logged in. Then while his laptop was logging in, he went and got his headphones, he got his manipulatives, he got worksheets and whatever else he needed to do work. He opened the laptop, went to the place where the teacher's digital presence was, so in this case it was a Blackboard course, and then went to the place in the Blackboard course, started his instruction, and waited for his teacher who was at that time working with another uh, small group of students. The neat thing was he wasn't the only one in this K-1 classroom. All of the students really had learned this repetition of this is how we get started. So when I hear people say, but my students can't do that, I try to remind them that even our kindergarten students, our youngest students, have learned in some places how to do this. And so all of our students are capable of doing this. Yes, it takes constant repetition with them. Yes, it takes really direct instruction, but our students can do this. They're capable of it. And in a way, it really is helpful for them because they start to own the learning process here. It's not something that's facilitated by somebody else. The other part is this. We'll talk a little bit more about mobility in just a moment, but when you have mobility, when your students have their own screens, we now can be filtering around the room at the beginning of class, but we'll have in our hand perhaps our iPad where we can take attendance, or we can conference with students and take notes and take our MacBook around or our iPad around. And at the same time, we can connect with kids, we can maybe move students into flexible groups. All the things that a teacher can do can be done, but they've also got that mobile device there to help them do some of this work. So that's something we just have to remember is we have great mobile tools in our district. Now we've got to put them to use and right at the beginning of the class is a great time to do that. So we're gonna slide into something that's very, very similar to this, which is student focus. So we've, we've kicked off our classroom, the kids know the rules, but we also have to maintain student focus. And this is one of the areas that really can be the most challenging from a classroom management standpoint with uh, devices available, primarily because students now have options. They can look at other things, they can do other things. So what we need to do is adopt a set of strategies and classroom management uh, tools that will ultimately help us keep student focus. One of my absolute favorites, and it's one thing that we heard right away when we started investigating one-to-one -one and what it meant to bring technology into the classroom, was a simple command or statement that we could give in our classroom to maintain some sort of focus. Now, teachers have been doing this for as long as I can remember, but now with the technology it becomes particularly important that they do this. One of the first ones we heard was apples up, and the picture shows that. What that means is a screen flat on the ground and an apple up. Some teachers have said screens down, hands off. Some teachers have said devices down, devices away, devices off. Lots of things that you can use, but what you really want to do is be consistent and work with your students K-12 on what this means, right? So our first graders, it's important for them as it, as it is for our 12th graders to say, when you're in this classroom and you hear me say this, this is my expectation. This is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like and feels like and model that for kids and remind them when we, when we say something like this and maybe they don't follow it we stop and we really make a teachable moment out of it and make a point of saying, when I say this, this is what I need from you. This gets the kids focused back on the instructor, which is really important from time to time. Another option, and this is really while you're teaching, um, is to use some sort of a timer. So the more time I spend in classrooms as, as well as being a teacher myself, one of the things that I totally get is that we can get really wrapped up in a moment. And some teachers have a great internal clock and really know like, okay, we spend two minutes and we have to keep moving. And others of us, um, 
really get kind of caught in the conversation. We get caught in the activity or one student asks a question or we get pulled into a, a side conversation. And what was a two minute activity turns into a six minute or a 10 minute activity. When we have that time where students, you know, the, the activity was designed for a short period and now they have more time, that's when our students really can get off task, right? That's when they, they have that free time to go explore. And when it only takes just a fraction of a second to turn on a different app on your iPad and hop into a game or hop into some, some other website, it's really, it's really important that we have structured time. A timer is really helpful for that because it automatically kind of just keeps that internal clock going. So there's a lot of different timers. Just the basic timer app on your iPad is a, is a great one. It's really functional. You can put it up using something like AirPlay or you can plug in. Um, if, you're, if you're using you know, the Chrome browser, you can put a one-click timer. There's timers everywhere. But the reality is if we can set those timers and broadcast them, Kids know this is the amount of time we have to work. And when you become consistent about saying the timer's up, the work is done, we need to move forward, that really will set a tone in your classroom that there isn't room for us to be off task. Last thing I want to say about that is just the idea of projecting for an audience. So sometimes we tend to uh, talk to our students, which is a great important piece, right? That verbal communication. But sometimes we cannot we cannot underestimate the importance of having a visual cue, some sort, something to look at, something to see, something to really learn from. And so we have a great opportunity to present to our students using our MacBooks or our iPads, whether that happens to be wired or, right, so you're actually plugging in, or wireless using something like Apple TV or Air Server. Those are ways that we can project for our students. It's also ways for our students to project to us. So we sometimes have to remember to ask students to share their screens, to make their thinking visible, to make their examples come to life for them in the classroom. That's where something like Apple TV or Air Server become really powerful because I can point to a student and say, why don't you share what you're thinking? That's great. Or I think we've got a teachable moment here. Could you share that? The other piece I want to mention about projecting for an audience is this. We all know that wireless is great when it works, but sometimes it fails us. And so I'd really recommend that every teacher have both a wired and a wireless plan. If you've got an Apple TV in your classroom, marvelous, and you should use it. But when it doesn't work, having a backup plan to say, I'm just going to plug my adapter in and we're going to carry on and now I've lost one or two minutes of instruction instead of my entire lessons thrown is really an important backup plan. So that's a key plan B for, for teachers to maintain student focus. So student behavior then becomes the next question, right? We can, we can lay the best laid plans. We can, we can really put out the best lesson, but we still have students who will occasionally be off, off task. And so we need to address that, right? But one thing I really want to remind everybody of is just a little bit of perspective. We've been teaching kids for a long time without technology. And from my best recollection, I have a hard time remembering a time when all students paid attention and behaved all of the time. Because there used to be kids who would pass notes to each other physically, and yes, now they are doing it a little bit more efficiently with iMessage, and it's maybe a little bit harder to catch or you know, chatting on Google. We used to have kids who would stare out the window, daydream. Now they happen to be getting caught up in worlds of gaming or doing something else on their iPad. But both times we had kids who were distracted. We used to have kids who would lose things or break things or forget things. The reality is that's going to happen with the technology. And we used to have students who'd say that they couldn't get their homework or it wasn't available or their dog ate it or whatever it might be. And now they could say, we didn't have internet at home last night or I couldn't get this done because I lost this file. So we've always had these behavioral issues that have existed. It just happens to be that they're new or, or presented in a different way to us now. So one reminder is we talked earlier about posting those rules and setting those rules and being consistent with them. But rules are only good if they're something that are referenced regularly, if they're posted and everybody's aware of them, and if we consistently live by them. So all of those behaviors I just mentioned, whether they were digital or before that kind of an analog issue that we had with students, if we didn't have rules and we didn't live by them, it was really hard and really frustrating to get kids to stay focused and stay on task. 
The other thing that you have on our on your side now is the advantage of mobility. When we started teaching with computers in the 90s and, and even a little bit before that, and every classroom had one, we were tethered to the wall. And teachers who used to be able to walk all over the room were now just standing in one place or near their computer or near the front of their smart board or wherever it might be. We now have mobility on our side and we need to use that to our advantage to keep kids on task. Well, how do we do that? The most powerful way to do that is to use our proximity to really kind of keep kids on, on task and focused. So one of the things that we mean by proximity is, and I love the graphic on the upper right, there are those kids in the closest zone to you, kind of in that red zone, who you can see immediately what they're doing. And then there's that group that's kind of in the yellow zone. They're just a little ways away from you. You might be too close for them to be uh, messing around too much or being too off task. And then there's those kids back in the corner in the green zone. You see it in the picture in the upper right. The ones who are kind of feeling like you're the most away from them and they can get away with the most being from you, uh, you know, furthest from you. So we really have to think about how, moving about frequently in our classrooms. And one tip that I have for you right away is arranging your classroom in such a way that there's a clear walking path so you can get through to those areas, right? So you're moving about the room and around the room. Sometimes we landlock ourselves as teachers. We can't get through because there's bags and desks and chairs in the, in the way and we can't get through our, our room. So setting it up in a way where you're always thinking about a clear path to get to every section is really important. Another key thing is to actually address off-task behavior. So walking by and seeing a student who's playing a game, that happens. Walking by, seeing a student who's playing a game and not doing anything about it or looking over his shoulder and walking away, that sends a very different message than maybe tapping on it or pressing the home button or saying, could you turn that off, right? So um, that's a real key is to actually address the behaviors when we see them every time consistently because we know consistency matters in classroom management. Those behaviors are going to happen. So one of the things we recommend is having a really clear cut version of your consequences in your classroom. One thing you can do is just spot check. And students who maybe are having more issues than others get more spot checks than others. In our district, we own these machines. We can take a look at them at any point, and I encourage you to do so. But if a student's really been off task, we can set up regular spot checks with them where we say, I'm just going to grab it from you at any point and see what you're up to or ask you to post yours up to the Apple TV or take a look at it. So that's one thing we can do to just keep them honest. What are the students continually having issues? And maybe it's just today or maybe it's been all week, right? Asking them to power down that can be a really important message. Now, for some students, just having to do that work without their device. So I know everybody else is writing in a collaborative Google Doc, but you, you're going to have to actually write this on a piece of paper, and you're going to have to turn that in to me, um, and I'm going to be able to read that before you leave today. That might be inconvenient enough for them to avoid doing it the next time. So sometimes turning that issue into their issue is an important one, but ask students to just power down and put it away. One of my favorite things to do with students when they really get off task is to say, you know what, we're going to need to make a, a phone call home. And that's going to not just be my job. We're going to do this together. I'm going to call home. I'm going to ask for mom and dad support or the guardian support. But you're going to be there with me. In fact, if it's bad enough or if I feel it's impactful enough, I'm actually going to have you call home with me and I'm going to say hello mom and dad I've got Johnny here and here's something that he needs to let you know and then I'll follow up with mom and dad after that so uh, we can still use resources like that 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 is one of those kind of classic we've always been able to do this kind of moments but we just have to be reminded that still works in a digital age if we have um, a penalty, right? So some, somebody does something that's just inappropriate and we need a five minute break or a 10 minute break or until the end of class break, I'd set up in my classroom a penalty box, just an area where that device can be placed near my desk or near somewhere, probably not next to the door just for the security reasons, but I'd probably put that iPad somewhere where I'd say, you're gonna have to go put your iPad up in the penalty box. You don't have to power it down. You don't have to interrupt your work. Just take it up there and put it up in the penalty box for me. And I'd continue on with the work. That way the students know, oh, I just lost mine for a few minutes. They can feel the inconvenience of that. 
Uh, but then they have to keep working, and that's the key piece, is just because your device is in the penalty box doesn't mean that you're done learning until you get it back. You've got to keep working. You've got to figure out how to do that. The last thing, uh, and this is a very technological uh, ability for us now, is the ability for us to lock down a device. So there's a great tool in our district called Casper Focus, and it's a tool that we can use to lock an identified student or a group of students into a single app. It is a powerful tool. It does take some setting up on the front end, and you do have to do a little bit to learn about it, but it's a great tool for managing our classroom. I'll, I'll have you kind of at least hear this. It's not a solution. Just, just like anything, it doesn't solve all of our issues, um, but what can it do? It can deal with an individual student or a really small group of students who are just continually off task, and it can lock them down and just say, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to do anything but be and explain everything. No web browsing, no outside, no camera, no photos, no messages, just in this app. Or you're just going to be locked into the browser for now. And it's a great tool for just kind of keeping on task behavior going. Yes, you could lock an entire group of students in. So if you really know that today you're just going to be browsing in the web browser, you can lock everybody into that. The only real limitation is it's rare, it's becoming more rare for us to do whole, whole group instruction where everybody does exactly the same thing. And so for us to be locked into just a single app really does create somewhat of an issue for, for the teacher. So you really need to think about that. You can only lock them into one at, at a time. Uh, also management can just be cumbersome at times, picking who's locked in and who isn't. And you ultimately have to remember to unlock those iPads at the end of the hour or else they're locked in until the next time somebody unlocks them. So this Casper Focus is a great tool and it can really be used meaningfully in your classroom, especially for students who are continuously off task. But just remember that none of these strategies, none of the classroom managers, management strategies fit a one size fits all kind of solution. And so there you have it. There are just some beginning ideas to get us going and to uh, start thinking about classroom management. Again, these technology strategies aren't really all that much different than a lot of the other strategies that we've used for classroom management for years to come. Some of them have had to take a little bit different twist, but in general, good classroom management, focused learning, meaningful, purposeful planning and learning in your classroom, that's going to solve a lot of the issues that we have with classroom management. And then beyond that, we have some strategies here that we can really work to. I encourage you to converse with your colleagues and talk about what they're doing in their classrooms and really kind of engage in this so that you're, you're consistent, but always have new ideas coming to you to see how other people are managing technology in the classroom and, and really managing their classrooms to focus on teaching and learning. As always, thank you so much for your time.